On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love. about the size that we had um, about four years ago. Well, we have 50 or 60 or 70 or I don't know how many is at the other place, but they ditched us uh, to hang out at the, the lake and, and have a retreat, which I would have been there typically, but, uh, but I'm thankful that you're here. Todd, we're grateful that uh, you uh, are here to uh, lead our praise and and worship, so thank you for that. We didn't warn you about the clicker. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So I'm glad you got to experience that uh, a little bit. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry that you had to experience that. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. And our desire is no matter how many we have or, uh, or lack thereof, uh, just to give God the worship and praise and glory and honor. Uh, I mean, we are kind of scattered out a little bit. Uh, maybe uh, that's how we want it, but if you want to move in a little bit, that'd be great. But I'm not going to make you do that because people hate when preachers do that, right? To make you move up or move over. So you guys sit wherever you're, you're comfortable uh, today, and we're going to praise God no matter what. We will have Children's Church uh, today, and uh, Leslie's going to, uh, uh, to do that uh, for us. Uh, you excited about that, Leslie? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you're not going to be idle, so we appreciate that. Um, next week, I won't be here. Uh, Tim will be speaking. Uh, Sherry has a week and a half left of uh, radiation, so we're so excited about that. Um, and so uh, hopefully in two weeks, uh, she will be able to be here, uh, and uh, that will be such a, an awesome time uh, for us. And uh, I do miss seeing her uh, as I uh, stand up here. So continue to pray for her, and thank you guys for just your love, your support, uh, your support in so many different ways. Uh, she is uh, doing doing good, and uh, she, was, she you think I would I would have lost a lot of weight because we walk at least five miles a day, uh, and uh, I uh, uh, just uh, hate when I have to leave during the weekends, but I'll go back tomorrow and then stay with her the rest uh, of the time. So uh, we're going to continue uh, our gathering here and our worship uh, to God. Let's pray. Father, appreciate you. Thank you for uh, just being with us as we've uh, all left our homes to come here. And you uh, sat next to us uh, and provided us safety. Father, in this gathering place, we desire to just lift you up in, in a variety of ways. 
our heart uh, to be open uh, to hearing something that you have to say uh, through a song or a prayer or a message or, or communion. Father, we appreciate how you um, look out at, uh, over us and, and lead us wherever we need to go. We appreciate um, your, um, your abilities uh, to heal us, uh, to give us uh, the resources w that we need, and to, um, to strengthen us when we feel weak. Uh, we uh, admire you. Uh, we honor you. Our heads bowed before you because uh, we revere you. As we continue to gather here uh, and to worship, uh, we want to give you the best seat in this house to praise you uh, from the depths of our heart and to honor you uh, with, our, uh, with our music uh, that stems from our love and adoration for you. We pray this to your son, Jesus, and the church said, let us stand for our reading, please. Good morning. So continuing building each other up, uh, continuing encouraging each other and building each other up just like you are doing already. Brothers and sisters, we ask you to respect those who are working with you, leading you and instructing you. Think of them highly with love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are disorderly. Comfort the discouraged, help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure no one repays a wrong with a wrong, but always pursue the good for each other and everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in every situation because this is God's will for you in Christ. Don't suppress the spirit. Don't brush off spirit-inspired messages, but examine everything carefully and hang on to what is good. Avoid every kind of evil. Onward rejoicing as spread last ways. Higher I'm climbing each passing day. Hilltops of glory now rise in view, where all shall be made new. Hilltops of glory I now can see. Safe on the mountain, I soon shall stand, hilltops of glory land. Footsteps of Jesus before us lead, we tread life's journey, his warning seed. Evil allurements cannot prevail, I'm all Psalm before the Lord's Supper, the boundless love. Boundless love, unending joy. This is my life. It's what I know. I can't believe that He selected me. Jesus, my Lord, is you I owe. Uh, 
one of the reasons we're here this morning is to commune with each other in this memorial supper that Christ has left us to uh, participate in. Uh, I guess one of the things we want to look at is what do we think about as we uh, participate in this Lord's Supper. And I've written a few things down here that uh, maybe we can think about as we participate in this memorial supper. The innocence of the Son of God, the unfairness of the kangaroo court that sent him to the cross, the mockery and beatings he endured to save mankind, including the lives of the very people mocking and beating him, the damage to his body is represented by this unleavened bread. The blood that was spilled from his body over several hours is represented, represented by this cup. The communion that we share with each other on this day as God's children. One other thought to consider, what are we going, what are we going to do after this memorial is over? How are we going to keep this new covenant with God written in the blood of Jesus the rest of this week until we gather here again next Sunday? Do this in remembrance of him, then remember him in our words and our deeds. We'll say a prayer for the bread. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day and the opportunity we have together in your name. And we thank you for this memorial that you've left us that we are able to participate that reminds us of your life here on earth and your uh, cruel death on that cross. We take this bread now, Father, that represents your body. May we do so in it's pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we'll say a prayer for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we continue in our thoughts and our prayer with you and thank you for this uh, fruit of the vine that we're about to partake of and what it represents, the blood that was shed on the cross, the blood that was, cleanses us from all sins. We thank you, Father, for uh, your son who was willing to make that sacrifice and for his life and his teachings while he was here and the fact that we know that he was risen on that third day and that it uh, gives us an opportunity to have a relationship with you and to be with you for eternity again we thank you for this cup and in, in Jesus name we pray amen opportunity to give back to God what is his that he's blessed us with Jerry if you'll go ahead and bring, come from, come up front with the plates and we'll say a prayer and then we'll pass the plates out you know uh, Shiloh I think has been well known for the opportunities that we have to do good in this community and and throughout the 
uh, the land here, we, we support a lot of good works and it takes our, us giving our, of our means to do this. So we want to give and we want to give with a cheerful heart to support the work that is done here. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity now that we have to give back to you uh, in a monetary way that, uh, that you've blessed us with. We thank you for our uh, families and uh, that we're able to support them and, and have an income and we're able to give back this uh, to do good in our community and all those uh, good things that we support here at Shiloh. Bless us as we give. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. song before the lesson will be, Our God, He is Alive. If you'd like to, please stand. There is beyond the azure blue A God can see from human side He takes the skies with heavenly hue And framed the worlds with His great mind There is a God Sometimes we 
cried. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together so quiet in this place <laughs> it's like eerily quiet um, I missed my little table I think I'm gonna have to bring that back out uh, you know I think a lot about what I'm gonna talk about months ahead uh, and I had a, a plan for 2024 when it talks about this when we were talking about discipleship and and how all of that works within the context of of uh, Christ Church, and it um, our, my plans aren't always God's plans. Do you guys ever find that uh, to be true for you? And you know, when you start out a year and you say, "Boy, this is going to be the best year ever," and you know, you get a month into it and everything goes uh, kind of haywire, and 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 you readjust. But never losing focus of who God is and what God's able to do and, and what he does for us. And as I was thinking about today, because I had to kind of do some uh, detours and, and change some things and, and reroute, uh, the desire to share a message has never changed and how we can connect all of this into a discipleship um, message is, is still relevant. And I know that many are in a retreat in Scottsboro, and, and some will watch this message a little bit later. Uh, but I want us to, today to really understand that there is a need for godliness in our world today. There's a need for us to be holy. Um, Paul told the believers at Ephesus in chapter 5, he says, don't even let there be a hint of immorality and he lists uh, many other uh, aspects of what immorality looks like. You know, to the world, immorality is different than what God sees immorality to be and what is accepted and not accepted. When we also talk about godliness, we talk about people who desire to be in connection with, a relationship with, a desire to be in um, a... Uh, a pure uh, understanding of, of how I represent Jesus in real time. To be the essence of hope and truth and peace and love and, 
and kindness and tenderness and and yet to give a message that people need to hear and to uh, understand. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, and uh, as as we will look at um, the first letter, chapter five, is is very important for us. I don't know how the hearers or the readers of this letter really took uh, this message, but I know for me, as I I'm looking at uh, these uh, tips for godliness that that. Uh, Paul had sent them. Really, they weren't tips. They were directives. Maybe I should change that. I can't do it at the moment, but directives of how to live a godly life. It's not a matter of, oh, this is a feel-good message. It's a matter of how we really need to be uh, in the communities in which we live. Not just on a momentary basis of what feels good for me in the moment or not that I uh, desire to offend someone but I really need to be the essence of truth all the time and how I represent that how I betray that how I teach that how I uh, communicate that is so vitally important you know we hear a lot that you know, Christians are the biggest hypocrites on the face of the planet. Have you ever heard that? You know, you, you practice one thing in the church house, but yet you live something differently Monday through Saturday. My name is Brian, and I'm a hypocrite. You know, it is truth uh, that, you know, if I'm going to be honest, I can't pass it over here and say, you guys are doing this, but yet I'm doing this. But I have to be honest and transparent, and I have to be uh, an individual that strives to be godly, but yet in my pursuit of godliness, I screw up royally. Can you relate this morning? You don't want to be irritated with people, and you don't want to say things out of irritation, but yet it still comes out, right? I don't want to be mouthy when I should be silent, but yet the mouth just seems to keep on flapping, the tongue, right? When I just need to be quiet, but yet God is hopefully in control, and yet he needs to to shut me up somehow, some way. And so when we look at, turn your uh, Bibles over to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. We talked a bit about this in class this morning. And I want you to see some things that are important. These are not feel-good tips. They are not, um, well, I hope that you would do it. Paul really meant for them to live it out, to be it. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them. I was going to do 10, and I thought, well, maybe that's too much, right? So I'll kind of condense it uh, in in a short message. And so as we as we look at it, look at verse 11. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. I like what the CEV says. It says, this is why you must encourage and help each other just as you are already doing. Because when you look at the world and you see how the world is behaving, it it is crazy to, um, to be in the world, but not what? But not of the world. I mean, we have to live in the world. But as he talks earlier, uh, as he's writing to them, he says, look, God does not want to bring down judgment on you. That's why he gave you Jesus. Because he wants you to experience salvation. He wants you to experience hope. He wants you to experience a life with him eternally. He wants you to to bask in the glory of something refreshing and and pure and and hopeful and, and... there's nothing dirty about it. It's all clean. He says, I want you to encourage them to keep on living the faithful life. I want you to continue to strive to uh, help each other get to that point because Jesus is coming. But I don't know if we believe that anymore. I got the amen. You believe it, I know. He's coming. 
but yet we live a life as if though he may not because he hasn't come in a couple thousand years. I want to encourage you to live a godly life, a hopeful life, a life that's transformative, a life that will teach other people that Jesus is in you, he is, he's uh, living, he's active, that the Spirit is controlling you, that you are not, that you are not living this life simply to be something that is about self, but something that will bring you closer to God. I am sick and tired of reading news uh, feeds that are, are so blatantly disregarding God's truth. And while we often decide just to sit down and be idle about it, you know, we hear Christians say, or I hear Christians say all the time, man, this world's gone to pot. Right? Maybe that's a Midwestern expression. You know, it, it's just going and it's really basically gone. But what about me? As a believer in Jesus, what am I doing to make a difference and an impact in a world that we need to experience and to express and to live out so that it will change people? Not for, as I talked about in my class this morning, not for our brand, not the Church of Christ brand, but for Jesus Christ. We don't have a brand. We have the Savior of the world who does make a big impact and a lasting impact if we continue to encourage people to live for Him, to live godly. Now, I can look at various scriptures like Galatians 5 and... and uh, 1 Corinthians 6, you know, those are go-to places for preachers that just want to hammer down on you. You no good bunch of sinners. Get your life right. Right? While they just stand up in their pulpits wearing their nice suits and, and looking down upon us as if though we are the peasants of Christianity. That's not what Jesus ever did. He slept and ate. On the, uh, around the streets to, to, to help people to, to experience a better life. You know, as, as the religious people were outside the doors of the, of the whatever uh, restaurant or pub or whatever you want to call it, and they're looking and saying, look, he's eating with sinners. Hey, guess what? We're worshiping with sinners. Hey, w if you go to a restaurant today, you're going to eat with other sinners. And the way that we behave toward other sinners is so important. Encourage them to be godly. Encourage them to see goodness. Encourage them to turn away from their godless behavior to being obedient to the Father. It's important to live moral and ethical lives. You know, we can't sugarcoat it. We can't say, you know, you know, we've got to be careful not to offend someone. The problem is, is we've gone so far the other way to be less offensive that we become offensive. Because we are not living out truth. I'm not saying living out truth in which we bash people over the head with the scripture. I'm saying let's teach them the very tenderness of God. But yet at the same time, God will show his disciplines toward those that just blatantly disregard how to live godly. And so encourage, I want to encourage you to be the essence of, of truth because Jesus is coming. I heard uh, preachers uh, when I was growing up V.E. Howard. Any of you ever heard of V.E. Howard? He wrote a lot of tracts, and maybe he was kind of more of a Midwestern kind of preacher. And he had uh, a motto. And every time I heard him preach, he would say maybe a hundred times. I think as a kid, we used to count how many times he would say, are you listening? Are you listening? I mean, over and over again, 
I want to stand up and shout out, yeah, I'm listening. Get the sermon over with, right? <laughs> yeah, you've, you've, you've preached an hour. <laughs> My parents would always have these gospel preachers over for dinner. So I, don't, I can't tell you how many preachers we had over uh, at our house for dinner. And I was kind of glad uh, they would come over because uh, we got extra food. And it was nice. You know, when you're number five of six kids, you, you know, we had a place that we had to sit. I don't know if you grew up like that. And so, you know, we had kind of this oval table, and my dad was at the head of the table. Then my mom was here, my brother was here, my sister was here, my other brother, my other brother, my, me, and then my other sister. You know, by the time you got over to five, man, it was, it was like you're, you're hoping you're going to get something. So, but when you had the preachers over, we got extra. But let me tell you something. I've heard some preachers preach some very powerful sermons that still stick in my head today. And the question, are you listening, is so important for us. Are we listening to God's word? Are we hearing what he has to say? I mean, today, are we listening about being an encourager? I mean, I, I want to encourage you. I want you to be an encouragement to the people that God places in your life. It's so crucially important. Well, he goes on to say, I like what the CV says, don't be hateful to people just because they are hateful to you. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one, isn't it? Just because they're hateful to you. How many of you have experienced hate from somebody? Yeah. How many of you, how many times have I experienced myself hating people because of the way that they treated me? Ooh, I'm getting in your business today. He says, rather be good to each other and to everyone else. This is how we live a godly life. It's not hate for hate. Love trumps hate. That's what Jesus did. They nailed him to a cross and he forgave them. They put him in a tomb and he resurrected he says in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all of you. He didn't exclude the haters. He said, all of you. Judas was a, was a, a, a madman who was money hungry. And as I mentioned last week, even though Jesus knew what Judas would do, he still washed his feet. He still invited him to the table. He still forgave him on the cross. He didn't retaliate revenge. He didn't cast him out as if he were a loser. He loved him. I want to be loved by Jesus just like that. I don't need some sarcastic theologian or preacher to hammer down and make me feel as if I am worthless because I'm involved in something that isn't right. I want them to stoop down and to love me tenderly and to help me get to the very place I need to be. Not to discard me. Not to hate me. Not to disfellowship me. But to encourage me and to love me for who I am. I may be a disappointment at times to people, but, but don't, don't push me away. It is a time in which you draw yourself in so that we can be a better and stronger family. Love everybody. You know, I, I think that, um, well, I don't think, I wonder. I wonder what God thinks about all of us today in our pockets of areas. I get that our, some of our folks are in a retreat. That's different. But pockets of areas where we drive into our parking lots and our, and our, and our nice places of, of worship and, and we can't eat. I mean, we can't worship in the same sanctuary. But boy, we're going to go to some of the same restaurants when it's over. And we're going to see people from other different groups of, of Christianity and and 
uh, we can't get along here, but yet we can eat together at a restaurant. Have you ever seen someone from another church? And you talked and you had conversation? I'm not saying that it's wrong to go to other places, but I will say that it's wrong if we can't go to another place because we dislike them. We don't agree with them. But try to find some commonality in which we can be a powerful presence in in the community in which God places us in. So don't be hateful. (laughs) Don't, um, Don't be distracting to the gospel because we have a mentality that if you do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. But let us figure out how we can stoop down or bend down and just love people even when we disagree, even when they are bad to us, even when they are hateful, even when they are spiteful, even when they gossip, even when they lie, even when they cheat, even when, even when, even when. It is so vitally important for us to be the walking Jesus everywhere we go. Now, I can never measure up to the Savior of the world, but I can be, you remember the phrase, be like Mike? I mean, some of you younger people don't know what that is, who he is. I want to be like Mike, Michael Jordan. I would like for you, and, and Paul said kind of the same thing, be like me because I'm like Christ. I would like for myself to be a model where people say, hey, I want to be like Brian because he's like Christ. But I don't want them to worship me. I want them to turn their hearts toward, to, toward God. But the way that I am able to be influential in these people's lives is the way that I treat them, the way that I love them, the way that I respect them. I, I show them the, the very uh, truths of Jesus Christ. And so don't hate Always, never, keep. Always be joyful, he says, and never stop praying. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. Always, never, keep. I mean, this is a model I want you to to, to think about. Always be joyful. Well, how? How in the world? I mean, the things that we're going through in our own family, it's hard to, to even comprehend how do you be joyful in the midst of brain cancer? Well, the stuff that you're going through, how can you be joyful when you're dealing with some bad news or, or family member suffering or financial problems or relational problems? How can you be joyful? I mean, James says the same stuff in chapter 1. He says, count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kind, how can you be joyful? You know, I've mentioned before that I struggle with anxiety, and let me tell you, when it hits, it hits hard. How many of you can relate this morning? It's a terrible feeling. How can you be joyful when all you want is some relief? You're afraid, and and for me, there are certain methods that I I do to, to work through that process. But he says, always be joyful. Well, you know, joy is a sustainable um, uh, byproduct of Jesus Christ in your life. You know, happiness is, a, is circumstantial. You know, I'm happy I have a big bowl of spaghetti with a bologna sandwich, right? I mean, that's how some people think. Happiness is walking on the beach. Happiness is, is having a pile of, of money in your bank account. Happiness is... Uh, having a, a date night and somebody's watching the children. I get an amen over there. <laughs> yeah. You know, happiness is holding hands with your spouse. Happiness is whatever that is for you. It's based upon your circumstances, but when those circumstances change, we become sad. Oh, I just need a break. Oh, I miss holding her hand. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. Joy sustains us. I mean, that's a fruit spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Love is, uh, and he says joy. 
You know, love is everything. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. Faith, hope, right? And love. Love is sustainable. Joy gives us that strength and that attitude and that, that emotion that will get us through the tough stuff. It's not based upon your circumstances, but it is what drives you through the hard stuff in life. So always be joyful, meaning when the Spirit is controlling us, that means that we can work through the tough stuff in our life. It gives us the necessary resource to not just fall apart and say, boy, God isn't involved in my life. He doesn't care. He isn't listening. He doesn't like me anymore. When I'm dealing with anxious moments, I have to turn my thoughts on the joyfulness of God so that I can be better and I can heal faster. So he says, always be joyful. Then he says, never, never stop praying. I want to tell you, there are moments in my life that it is hard to pray. Can you relate this morning? It's hard to pray. What do you say? I want to tell you, and I know Maylie's here, but I want to tell you that when Sherry was diagnosed with brain cancer, it was some of the most difficult times of my life for me to even pray to God. It was hard. I didn't even know what to say. To be straight up, I didn't even want to talk to him. I'm just being transparent. But that wasn't the time in which I needed to stop praying. It was the time in which I needed to move toward him, but I didn't know what to say. I was ticked off. I was afraid. I didn't know what the future was going to hold. But I know that I have a sustainable God that will get me through it and I can count all joy even in the midst of my circumstances, but I need to talk to God through it all. Even if it's, hey, even if it's, hi God, or I can't, or I don't know what to say, God, you know my heart, that's all I got to say, but never stop praying. Because once I move out of that conversation with God, then I get, dig myself a deeper hole and I find myself in a dark place and nowhere to go. And there are times in which people say some really dumb stuff to us. Have you had somebody ever tell you some really dumb stuff? You know, they're trying to be helpful. But yet what they're saying isn't what you needed to hear. But it makes them feel good, right? Paul is reminding the people that you're going to go through some crazy stuff in your life, some real tough stuff, but never stop praying. Talk to God. My drive from Jacksonville, Florida to Lexington, Alabama is filled with a couple of things. It's filled with conversation with God and music that reflects a godly attitude within its lyrics. And so I talk to God and I worship God for 10 hours. I'm not saying that makes me holier than anybody else. I'm saying that's what I have to have. Then when I get stuck on I-65 like I do several times because of traffic, it gives me a better, better thoughtful attitude. So when I'm by myself, this is what I do. This is what I need. Because I should never stop having conversation with God. Life is hard. Really hard. The temptations I have are hard to get over. People in my life that are hurting, it's hard. It's hard to watch my dad go back and forth to the hospital and stay for several days. Knowing he has advanced congestive heart failure, it's hard. God, why is my dad going through that? God, why is my wife going through that? God, 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 what in the world's happening? But I'm not the only one experiencing it. You experience it too. 
So never stop praying. But keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. The focus is Jesus Christ. It always goes back to Jesus Christ. It should always be Jesus Christ. I am not suffering nowhere near Jesus Christ and his experiences. I mean, he had, he owned the universe. He created it. I mean, when you read Genesis and it says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, you know, obviously there was a family going on creating this entire universe. And yet he steps out of perfection into imperfection so that we could become perfect. And one day we will. But thanking God for Christ Jesus is, is so important because it takes everything off, the focus off of me. It takes the focus off of what we're going through. It takes the focus off of our, our, my anxiety. It takes the focus off of my trials and tribulations. It takes the focus off. It can't be about me. It has to be about Jesus Christ. And so when we make it about him, everything becomes a better focus. And our attitude becomes much better and our life becomes more clear. And so, for me, I need these reminders. I hope that it has given you some, some good thought. We visit a, a church in Jacksonville, and I'll go there next Sunday, and Terry was there today, called the San Jose Church of Christ. If you're ever in Jacksonville, go to that church. It's a church of about 300, maybe 400. And it is a worsh, worshipful place. You know, we were kind of scattered out, and it's probably hard to leave singing, and, a, and, a, and you know, when we're all scattered out, and, and it would be hard for me. I'd be terrified to do what you're doing, but I can do this and not be terrified. I don't understand how that works. Um, but it brings tears to my eyes to hear it, it, it's like if, to me our gatherings must be a place that is heavenly it's, it's like how it would be in heaven it is so inspiring and so inspirational and, and, and it's because they have a lot of people that brings that about and so it's something that, that just sticks out for me when I'm there. I don't know what it is for you when you come to this place. You know, it could be the music, it could be the praying, it could be the message, it could be whatever, but I hope that I'm encouraging you somehow today. I hope that you will walk away having something uh, that will be lasting and helpful that whomever you are around in your little communities you got your work communities and your friends communities and your family communities. I hope somehow you will always never and keep. I hope that that will be transformative in your life. For this church, and as I said earlier, when I first came here June 7th, 2020, this is about how we were. <laughs> Remember those days? And it's a beautiful testimony of God's, um, God giving us his blessings to continue to grow as, as a church. Not to be bigger than anybody else in number, but, but to be bigger than Satan by being able to overcome his attacks. I want people as Shiloh, not because I want to say, boy, I'm, I'm this awesome minister, but I want people at Shiloh because I want them to experience something good and positive, graceful, something that will demonstrate mercy and forgiveness, and we all leave this place better than we came. And I'll close with this. 
we found this spot in St. Augustine, Florida. Anybody ever been to St. Augustine, Florida? They have this street called St. George Street. Any of you ever been to St. George Street? You need to go. It's the oldest city in the United States. And down this, down this road, and they have, um, you know, the, the brick roads and, and uh, the, the old buildings. Some of them were built in the early 1800s. The town was established as a fort around the 1600s uh, by people from Spain. And, and, and we, we toured the fort and we, we did all of these things. It's, it's a beautiful place. Mainly got to go. It's a beautiful place. And, and I, I get away. Any of you have that place where you can go and you can just get away? And, just kinda, and I just get away. There's, I mean, thousands of people walking down these, these roads. And, and um, it, at one time, there were, it was, it was their, their home. And now it's a tourist place. But as I'm walking down and, you know, we're going to these nice shops, there were benches here and benches over there, and you go down the side streets and there are benches there. And on those benches were homeless people. And I walked by them. And in my mind, I thought, how did they get here? What brought them here? How did they find St. George Street? And thousands of people, including myself, are walking right by them. And I never said a word to either, any of them. But I wondered, how did they get there? Um, Gina had asked a question, or maybe her minister had asked the question, she posted it, and says, you know, what would you say, or how can you help homeless people, or how, how can you get to know them, or I can't remember exactly. But after I thought later, is why didn't I go sit down on the bench next to them, next to them and say, hey, my name's Brian, what's your name? And I'm ashamed that I did not do that. But yet I walked by as I watched them sleep. And maybe that's just where they needed to be, but, but Let's, let's move even just a little bit further than that. There are many of us sitting in these seats, and you're sitting in your, your seat, and you sit in there. Most, most Sundays, this is where you sit. And we walk by you. Many of us walk by you and never say a word. There are homeless people physically and some of them sometimes choose to be in that environment. And there are other reasons why they're there. But I really believe that there are homeless people spiritually. Think about that for a moment. That we have nowhere to go. Nobody talks to us. We're tired. We're worn out. And we come to our place of worship. And it seems as if though we have a stench because no one says a word. And we look at them and we think, why are you here? Why aren't you doing anything? You're taking up space. And we don't reach out to them at all. Is it possible that we have spiritually homeless people, believers, in this room today who just simply share their story, who simply want to be home. Home. Who just simply want to be home. And if this cannot be home, then we are in big trouble. Because Christ Church is about being home that I belong, that I am somebody, that I am saved by the grace of God. That eternity with Jesus is where I'm going to be. And I encourage each of you not to walk past 
um, anyone, but to be fully engaged in everyone in this family. Somebody just need, might just need you to walk by and say, hey, how are you doing today? Or reach your hand out or hold your arms open or invite you over or to go to lunch or to simply know that somebody knows my name. I just simply want somebody to know my name. So, always, never, and keep. This is a big, big, big universe. God has placed us in certain places for us to to make an impact. Will you step out and make that impact? Be the Jesus that people need to see. We're not advertising a brand. We're living out the Jesus who died and was buried and was raised for all of us to live in eternity with him. This is true. This is hope. It is your time. This is your moment for you to think about your relationship with him and how you can make a big difference in the world today. Let's stand and sing. Brother Barbara.